likewise, you know, and what's what's fascinating, or, or I guess I guess kind of fascinating is that there's a lot of research out there about things like fasting and lifting weights and cutting weight and all these things, but it's almost all exclusively for men. In, 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 yeah, and, and so people understand it's not because of bias, at least not in my opinion. The reason being it's easier. Mm. And, and tonight is going to really help, uh, you know, the, totally random, but hopefully tonight even helps us understand why it's so much easier because men and women, we are significantly different, especially when it comes to our hormones. So it's going to be a great conversation for both men and women tonight about fasting. And I'm super excited to be able to introduce maybe a new perspective on intermittent fasting when it comes to women specifically tonight, because I'm going to dive in some details, but I promise you, I'm going to say some things that are for both men and women that hopefully take your approach or your thought process about intermittent fasting, fasting, time restrictive eating, whichever one you want to call it, doesn't matter. Hopefully it'll take your approach or your thought process toward those and open up kind of a whole nother kind of category, if you want to call it, in terms of how we are looking at it in terms of how does how does fasting really benefit the human body? So that that's going to be my ultimate goal tonight with, of course, creating massive clarity and hopefully some ease for our women. That's awesome. I know that we are going to make it simple tonight, Bart. There's a lot of information on the market about fasting. So I'm looking forward to that. Before we dive in, Bart, do you have any clinical insights today? I do a couple cl- couple quick clinical insights. Um, very very interesting. Where so often the things just repeat. So that's one of the reasons I offer these clinical insights. And if you're new to the show, welcome. Of course, we love having you here. The whole goal here is to help make health simple. And part of the reasons I share some clinical insights, which are really insights of me in clinic, that I think of these moments or I have a moment with some with one of the clients and say, ah, oh, this is probably sh- something. I could share with the group that are probably have meaning to many, many people. This is a particular one because it came up a couple of times today. And we're having a conversation more than one time about people that were in their groove, if you want to call it, doing a lot of good, healthy things, eating better, exercising better, paying more attention, quite frankly, to their overall health in both circumstances that I was involved with today. That, That was true across the board, sleeping better, taking supplements, and yet... In the current moment today, while they're in the clinic, they were coming up short. They were having issues. And I could sense a little bit of frustration for both of them. And I and I get this a lot. So listen, I'm talking to everyone out there who you do all the things and you're still coming up short every now and then. And you're wondering, I don't get it. I don't understand. I do this and I do that and I do this and I do that. And listen, the pursuit of health is relentless. Relentless. This world we live in is a tough one, and not because people are mean. I think people are kind generally, yet because the the environment at times is tough. The chemicals that we have, the schedules that we keep, and this year is much different than it was last year, and we're going to say the exact same thing next year. So for everyone out there that is working hard, high five to you. My, My advice is this, keep working hard. You are worth it, I promise you, and I will also tell you this that you will have to continue to be relentless. What you were doing last year is not enough this year. You're going to have to do more and more. If for no other reason, there's this thing called aging that is happening. So as a result of aging a little bit, you're going to have to do things a little bit smarter, a little bit better, a little bit more relentless, a little bit more precise than you've ever done in your past. And the beauty is most of the time, most of the time, you're going to get, re- reap the benefits of that. Do you find, Bart, on your health journey that as you become more relentless, as we like have a little bit more time here on earth, can it also be like fun as you add in new like practices? Absolutely. I think I think the more you dive in and instead of fighting it and you really start to observe and enjoy the journey, I actually think you do enjoy it because your benefits are there. So it's like saving money. You're like, and actually, no, your, your account looks bigger, right? And I think the same thing can happen with health as long as we're not fighting reality. And I think, Whitney, that is such a huge part of it when, so for my, a quick example would be, if you're, if you're drinking alcohol every night, it, it's never going to change, right? If you're eating you know, fries and chips every single day, it's never going to change. Like those things are still not good for us. And if you're fighting that reality, it's gonna be a tough journey. Yet on the other side, 
if all of a sudden you have less alcohol and you're having less French fries and you're doing a little more exercise and you're having, you've got a good supplement rep regimen going on and you're starting to incorporate more things, I think you literally start to find the joy in the efforts because they're going to be paying off. It reminds me a little bit of this um, thing that you and I offer from time and again, the great cleanse. And mm -hmm. uh, we always advise people that we share that there's usually like a bumpy moment there at the beginning. You're doing new things. You're like removing some practices. But sure enough, like as you slide into past those rough days, there's like this smooth thing that happens on the other side where the benefits start to come through. Mm -hmm. You know, interesting enough, it makes me think of a conversation, another conversation I had two different times today. It was about alcohol. And I was asked, or really, or we were talking about my my usage of alcohol. And I don't really know when the last time I had a drink was. I, I'm going to just throw out there 10 years or so. And it wasn't, I never drew a hard line in the sand. So I, I never was like anti-alcohol. In fact, I loved it most of my life. It was, it was a big part of my, my, my social being. And yet, as time went, I started to enjoy my health more. So that was part of the journey. So it wasn't that I was trying to hang on to alcohol while I was trying to get healthier. I just started to enjoy health more. And then, you know, I certainly wasn't going to drink and then go the next day and see patients. So I stopped having alcohol on the, on, during the week. And then it was just on the weekends. And then the next thing you know, I was tired on the weekends and I couldn't understand why I could beat myself up. So it was an easy let go when my target was clear and my my target was clear. I just wanted to feel better and move better and enjoy life more. So I think when that that part of it is what makes the enjoyment of all of the things that we do, the exercise, the sleep, the supplements, the, the fasting, whatever it may be. Yeah. When the, when the exchange becomes equal, that's a good yeah. moment. Yes. Yes. So that, th those are my clinical insights. And I think they probably are, you know, are good for every one of us to hear that the pursuit needs to be relentless. Every, what is it that you say, Bart? Move every bone, every, every muscle, muscle every, every bone, joint. every joint. Yeah. Every day, every way. Yeah. Every day. Every now, day. I'll say it again. So we're getting, it was clear. So you got to move every muscle, every bone, every joint, every way, every day. And if you do that, you get to get up tomorrow and do it again. Yeah. In every day, right? Every Doesn't day. Yeah. Like take Tuesdays off. Not exactly. And that's my whole idea about, you know, the idea of doing push-ups every day. And it's so you can do them every day. The moment we start, we stop with our push-ups, the moment we stop stretching, the moment we stop moving our body or going for our walks or whatever it may be, that's the only time that the age really gets to settle in and start to take a hold of us. If you're moving every day, you're moving every day. This is going to be very little room for you to get too tight or too decrepit. Well said, Bart. Well, I am so excited to shift gears now into women's health. So one on one on uh, one on one for fasting women. Yes. Yeah. Where shall we begin, Bart? Well, let's let's begin with this. We'll, we'll call this for the most part fasting one on one for women and or fasting for women one on one. Let's 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 just start by saying this: that yes, weight loss is a side effect, but it's certainly not the reason we fast. And by that is probably as important as anything I'm going to say tonight about fasting, because, you know, I, I'm a big advocate of intermittent fasting. In fact, I'll say this. I think that we are born to fast. Just looking at our DNA, looking at what our ancestors did, looking the way that our mitochondria turn over, look at autophagy, all the things we'll, we'll talk a little bit about tonight. We recognize that fasting is one of the built in processes that is not just good. We'll go as far as saying required for the body to turn over cells. And so we become a stronger, best version of ourselves. So with that being said, let's set aside for a moment that, that fasting is used to lose weight. And I completely understand that it's often a side effect and it often can go kind of disarray. It can, it can get it can actually make things out of balance if we don't understand when to fast and when not to. And for listen, ladies, I'm going to do my best to, to make this as simple as I can. But we are when men and women are different. So men, for the most part, I could sum this up and say you can have a regular fasting schedule five, six days a week for the rest of your life. You'd probably be just perfectly fine. Women, that's not so true. There's one small group of women that, that might apply for, and that'll be in postmenopausal women. And yet we'll make sure we cover that by the end of this time as well. 
Awesome, Bart. Um, and that, so if we were not approaching fasting to be like primarily weight loss is the benefit, are there other benefits to fasting? 100%. So just in general, while we are fasting, the fasted state is a healing state. So that just that part of it. So we can't be eating and digesting food, but also healing at the same time. So just let's just recognize that. So that's, I know it sounds, it's kind of interesting, right? So if you're eating, you're actually not healing. Now you got to go to work. So now you have to take all those nutrients and do something with it. So we are only healing when we're in a fasted state. So it's important that we just recognize again, that fasting is good for all of us. And now we're going to identify what does that mean? Because some people say, well, I fast until basically I pass out or, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just trying not to eat as long as I can. And I get shaky. So there's different times and there's so there's a why and there's a place and a time and a time frame that's better, good and better for, you know, for for different people. The benefits far reaching here. So, of course, weight loss. Let's just, we'll throw that out there. Weight, weight loss is wonderful. Yet there's other things like hormone balance, replacing and repairing gut. We talk a ton about gut gut health here. So if you want to restore your microbiome, which we're going to go into in just a moment, you know, if you can get out to a 24-hour fast, you're going to do incredible, incredible benefits to your microbiome. Uh, things like acne and PCOS, for example. I think 30 to 40% of all the women, cycling women in our country have PCOS, that's polycystic ovarian syndrome. And it can be very, very painful. It can interfere with fertility. <laughs> like there's a lot of things. Fasting is probably the most significant way to impact PCOS because PCOS is essentially uh, caused by insulin resistance. And if you want to heal up insulin resistance, how do we do it? The single most powerful way is incorporate intermittent fasting. And there's another thing, in, in, uh, insulin resistance, which is a plaguing our country, type two diabetes, plaguing our country, uh, intermittent fasting is something that can certainly clear this up. So hormone balance and gut repair, I can go on and on and on acne, all of these different things. Certainly intermittent fasting can play a huge, huge role there. Oh, and even if you have like some damaged cells, maybe even like cancerous cells, is it true that sometimes fasting is part of those protocols? Yeah. So that, that, that's the fun stuff that we're going to get in tonight and what along the way. So there's something called autophagy. And autophagy is when literally your body kills off cells. There are cells that your body kills them off because essentially it can starve them off. So it can speed up the turnover rate. I'll throw some technical things out there. Yet it's kind of fun, fun to understand these. So we have something called senescent cells. Do not ask me to spell that. And senescent cells that are cells that no longer go into, into division. They're essentially just waiting to die. So they're no longer functional for our body, but they're in our bodies. And these are the cells. So the longer they're in our bodies, essentially the faster we're aging and we're down-regulating the function of our mitochondria because we have massive, like millions, tens of millions of these senescent cells hanging out in our body. And if they're there, it's taxing to the system. So when we fast and we get to a certain amount of hours in our fast, which usually means we got to get up to about that 17 hour window to kick in the autophagy. If we're doing that and we're clearing out all these senescent cells, we're literally anti-aging, which is pretty, pretty fascinating. Yeah, that's awesome. What a cool approach to um, kick down the clock. <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah. And let, let's let's talk clock for a little bit. So there's there's two major things I want to cover today. So I want to talk clock, but I want to talk hormones. Too. Now, I tell you, what, we're going to talk hormones first. Yeah. OK, let's do yeah, it. The, the clock part makes sure men and women, men and women, everyone listen to it. That's what I think is the fun part of tonight. Let's talk. Let's do a deep dive for a moment here about women's hormones and talk about how we need to probably know more. All of us, all your doctors need to know a little bit more about the women's, you know, female hormones. And most women need to learn a little bit more about their hormones. And the way I want to map this out for everyone tonight is this. It's really understanding your hormones when and where they are through the course of your cycle. So let's assume there's about a 28-day cycle. And if you understand what hormones are present during that cycle, you'll also be able to understand what emotions you may be having what food cravings you might be having and when is it op when is it when what is the most opportune time to be fasting because it's not all 28 days and i think this is where there'll be some if people you know 
listen to enough Instagram and, and Facebook, you're thoroughly confused. You'll hear that fasting is wonderful, but then you hear that fasting messes up hormones. Fasting does not mess up hormones. Fasting, when done properly, is probably one of the single best ways to balance a female's hormones versus anything else there out there that can do, including uh, hormone replacement therapy. And, and we could probably spend a minute on that as well. So anyways, let's just talk generally about estrogen and progesterone. So let's just say we have a 28-day cycle. Your estrogen in the beginning part, days one through 14, it's on a steep climb. So that this really means from the day that you day one of your cycle. And hopefully, you know, I'd also say this way, and maybe we could add um, an app. I don't, I certainly don't have one, but if there, we, I think all women would benefit from tracking their cycle. Awesome. Then, we'll add one for sure. And also just to mention in the case you use the aura ring that tracks it as well. Okay. Fantastic. That's, that's amazing. That's awesome. I didn't know that. So what we can do with that is apply what I'm about to say tonight, because there's different times during your cycle that, yeah, get after it, go for a long fast. And there's other times, no, no, no. And the same thing when it comes to like carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. And I'm going to, I'll break those down in just a moment here. So in the first part of your cycle, days one through 14, roughly, this is where estrogen's on a steep climb. And the estrogen hormone in the body, this is essentially, this is the hormone that makes you want to be social. Want You want to get outside. You want to go hang out with other people. You want to talk to people. You're chatty, you're chatty, chatty. You want to go do things. This is also the time that you would push yourself with your exercise. You would do longer runs. You might get on your Peloton and hammer it out because estrogen is very conducive to that type of activities. This is also when you could push yourself with your intermittent fasting. And what is push yourself for, for the female? This could be if you're, if you're fasting on a regular basis, somewhere between 14, 17 hours, maybe extending a couple of days to 18 hours. But that window right there, very healthy. And that's, that's good. We're going to talk about different hours. If you really want to push it, you are going, you're going to take knowing where you are in your cycle and then use the information that I'm going to give you in just a moment here. So, Estrogen is your let's be social, let's get out, let's move and groove, let's get after it type of hormone. But right when you ovulate, which is, let's just say it's right in the middle of months, days 12, 13, 14, this is a time you do not want to be heavy fasting. So this is when you would pull back because this is when your body's going to ovulate, you're going to get a spike in testosterone here. And this, this really opens up a can of worms for a whole other conversation when I see how many young women right now, young women, just women in general, are starting to take testosterone in pellets and in shots and in creams and are doing it their entire cycle through the, you know, through the whole, you know, day one through 28, they're taking testosterone. That's a whole other problem, um, which we won't address tonight. But nonetheless, your spike in testosterone is essentially going to happen from about days 14, uh, I'm sorry, 12, 13, 14, middle of the month. It's when you're ovulating this, when your body kicks out a couple of these, these little cells, these, these follicles that you potentially could get pregnant with. And, and if you don't get pregnant, what happens after that is your estrogen starts to drop. Right when that happened, but, it, but it's still high, you could go fast for another couple of days, no big deal. But then after about a week, that is when your estrogen drops and progesterone starts to go high. It starts to climb. And this is what I'm going to give you a little thing to key, key on here. So. When we fast, we do produce cortisol. It is a stressful state. That is how we increase autophagy, which we're killing off all the weak cells. But when progesterone is supposed to be developed, we do not want cortisol. And this is important. This is where we can get in with some women, really kind of mess things up. It's not going to happen. Listen, if you fasted really hard for a month or two at a time, most likely you got just huge benefits. You start to extend that out three, four months, five months. Now you've been doing the same schedule for a year. This is where trouble ensues. All right. So you're getting into the space. You're getting in that week before your period comes. This is a moment. So when, per, when progesterone goes high, or I should say it this way, when cortisol goes high, progesterone goes shy. Meaning this, if you have high stress that week before your period comes and you're inducing that stress, that's when, that's when progesterone is going to be pushed down. So we don't want to induce it. We're going to have enough stressors in life. We don't want to intentionally create a stressful situation for the body 
So it would be a prolonged fast. That's when you get into that 16, 17, 18 hour fasting. Because if your cortisol goes up, progesterone is most likely going to go down. That's when hormone imbalances can kick in. So we, we've seen that and we've discussed it here on this on the Health Made Simple show before, where we call it a progesterone steal. So your body believes that cortisol, which is a stress hormone, is more important than your sex hormones. So if you have high prolonged stress, your body will start to steal your progesterone to make more cortisol. So we really want to be mindful of the week before your actual period. And this is when, when I'm going to throw some other things in here to make people feel good about what, what and how to do. This is when typically I'll hear from my patients. I've heard it from my wife for years. I'll hear from a lot of my female patients that this is when they crave more food. So progesterone in general needs more of nature's carbohydrates. Estrogen, protein and fat. So if we know this, and if you, you're tracking your body and you want to kind of I do this in an ideal way, heck, in the first two weeks of your cycle, go ahead, intermittent fast, fat and protein, rip it up, go after it, go kill it on the Peloton, et cetera. The last week of your cycle is where we got to be careful. And this is where I, I've seen clinically so many challenges because we stick with the same thing over and over and over again. So Bart, if someone were in a state where they were having this progesterone steal, what might they experience? Yeah, probably the biggest thing, once the progesterone drops, is anxiety. And followed closely behind that will be depression. And I know many women listening to this right now, they're going, oh, is that why I have anxiety leading up to my cycle? Is that how I almost know when my period's coming? And the answer is yes. A whole nother can of worms where, where it all changes a little bit is my postmenopausal women. I'm sorry, my perimenopausal women, where they don't necessarily have a cycle that they can track. It's, you know, one day, one month is 28 days, then it's 60, then it's 45. So they have to know their bodies even more. And when they recognize that there's a little bit of that anxiousness, you got to make the assumption that the progesterone is not being produced properly. So we want to do anything and everything we can to nurture thy body. That's when you might stay home. That might you say you take a Friday night off, you stay home and just sleep in with the dogs or something. And you might also nurture the body with nature's carbohydrates. And notice that I'm not saying carbohydrates just by themselves. And reason I've made that mistake. So listen, progesterone loves when you have nature's carbs. But if I just say carbs, people think bread. And that's not what I'm talking about. So we're talking like vegetables. Yes, I'm talking about like sweet potatoes and we're talking about uh, broccoli and cauliflower, nice salads. And this is a perfect time when right that week before to load up on those things, give it a little more calories, but do it with a healthy, you know, with our healthy foods. There's no opportunity. There's no event that poor food is better off for us. So with this kind of measurement of tra tracking the cycle, the week before the period, we're lo loading up with nature's carbs. And then the moment that your period starts, that's your day one, correct? Correct. That's your day one. That's when often most women will even tell me clinically, and once it comes, I feel fine. They feel better. And then they start to on the road to recovery. And this is when you can kind of dig down, you can kind of hunker down again. And you can, then it would be a perfect time to do some intermittent fasting. Maybe you extend it a little bit. Maybe you get back out to that 16 hours. So the time that it was dropping down during, you know, like progesterone and you were, were not going to intermittent fasting, even during those times, everybody should always be able to go 12 hours. Again, remember, we heal when we fast. And it goes right along with sleeping. And that's so they go hand in hand, right? And interesting, I mentioned that because when I first started in my intermittent fasting journey, I don't know when it was, maybe seven, eight years ago or something. Um, I thought, oh, 12 hours, no big deal. I couldn't, it was very difficult for me. So I went to bed late and I would have a snack right before bed. And I, so I was eating 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night and I'm an early riser. So I was getting up at 5 a.m., which is really only fasting for six hours. And I would eat sometime in my first hour so six, seven hours later, I was eating. So the first time I started, and I, and I, you know, I'm a knucklehead. So of course, I didn't start at 12 hours. I started at 18 hours, and I did that three days straight. I thought I literally thought I was like lose my mind. I was, I was, I was, the first, the first time you fasted was 18 hours. Am I hearing yeah, this right? Yeah, three days okay. in a row. Yeah, first, team, first, first time I did any type of fasting in three days in a row, 18 hours, and I was monitoring my blood sugar levels, and they were through the roof. 
it was, it was interesting. You'd think I'd be in ketosis and everything. I wasn't. Mm-hmm. My body was so stressed out because I made such a drastic change. I went from eating basically every six to seven hours, you know, overnight, and then snacking all day long. Even though I was eating healthy, I was snacking through the course of the day. So it was very I stressful. I, I bet you felt pretty weird. Oh, was, I, my brain was like, and finally, I was at, I was at a three-day conference. And I was every like five seconds, I had to like, what, what did they just say? It was, it, was, it was kind of fascinating to see how my brain was checking out. So, so if you're new to intermittent fasting, 12 hours is a great place to start. It's actually the smart place to start. And then you kind of add on to there. So let's roll from there. So we're going to break that down. We're basically, I'm going to, I'm going to sum that up about the female part of this and say this, as much as you can track and know where you are in your cycle. You're, when you're producing higher levels of estrogen, you literally have different emotions in your body. You have different desires. You have more motivation. You have more bravery, the, right? Especially like when your testosterone's released, right? Days 12, 13, 14, those are your like brave days. You go out and get it, all that good stuff. But then a week later, 10 days later, and, progest- and your estrogen goes away and your progesterone comes out, totally different, a little bit more recluse, a little more emotional. And if your progesterone is low, then we start to see the anxiousness in the, you know, potentially even the depression. Oftentimes they go hand in hand. All right. So hopefully that's relatively clear. And that's the part that for women, we really need to know. And also know this, that when cortisol is high, progesterone will go shy. So higher stress drives your progesterone low. So if you can map things out, and I'll explain what I mean by that. So listen, let's just say that you are a marathon runner. Let's not run a marathon three days before your period. That would be something that could significantly alter hormones. This is the same reason, Whitney, why we say female athletes, because they don't get to play by the clock. They have to perform when they have to perform, often have disrupted cycles later in life because they're under that duress, they're producing that cortisol 28 days a month. So they're not getting a break. They're, they're not, you know, they're not, well, hey coach, listen, my progesterone's coming here. I'm gonna take a nap. That doesn't work that way, right? So in the event that we're thinking of this in terms of just being healthy, strong human beings, vibrant young women, the way we wanna do it is really understand where you are in your cycle so you can honor that. And the more you can do that, especially in the the seven days leading up, it being as close as you possibly can to circadian rhythm, uh, getting extra sleep. Maybe that's when you get a massage or acupuncture. Uh, Maybe you stay home a little bit. You expend less energy outward. And then the moment that day one comes, click game game on. You go get it. I'm glad that you bring that up, Bart, because when we talk about the stress that could potentially increase your cortisol, which would then make the progesterone go shy, it's not just like stress from a work meeting. It's literally like how you're eating, how you're sleeping, how you're moving. Everything can contribute, right? Yeah. So we said you mentioned eating. So if you're eating lots of sugar, so we have that's an issue as well. And unfortunately, and that's why I really want to be clear about nature's carbohydrates. So I find a lot of women prior to their period that they're craving and they and they get into the habit of eating chocolate and candy and bad foods. You're doubling down on, on the damage to your hormones. So you're driving those down. You say, well, it's just this time of the month. And I'm just going to have this. Well, I understand that. And that is kind of the craving that your hormones are kind of leaning you toward, but making good op, make, making good choices in that in those moments really then become kind of your target and your, you know, kind of your principal focus, because if you, if you're doubling down and you're getting more sugar during that time, you're really stressing the system out double time. All right. Well, we're still on this topic of like women's health in relation to fasting. Can I also just ask you, is there a best time for women to run labs like during their cycle? Yeah, there, there is. So there is, there's right around about day 19. That's, that's a target. That would probably be the thing. If someone said, what is the best time someone could run labs? I would point you right around day 19, 20. That'd probably be the best time. Yeah. Awesome. And and I'll tell you what, clinically, this is what I tell tell most of them. For for many women that are already in the imbalanced state, and that's when many of us as practitioners see the woman. So it's very difficult oftentimes to be able to get those labs during that time. So I will tell them with confidence that the labs are good. We don't need them, though we can still be very successful 
if you don't have the labs. Now, if we do have the labs and you're able to do it around those days, fantastic. And there's other things that we could learn from the labs, like iron levels and, and whatnot. So just blood glucose levels, insulin resistance levels, especially if we run, like so that we run a, a comprehensive female panel. As much as I want to see those hormones, I want to know what your insulin, your response to insulin is doing. Because if you're, if you're having any signs of insulin resistance, that's our target. That absolutely becomes the target because unfortunately, the way that things work right now for, for the female is that if you're the doctor and you're expressing or kind of saying, man, there's something out of balance here. The, one, of the, one of the first modalities right now, Whitney, is birth control pill, no matter what your age is, regardless whether you're not you're trying to control birth, they use that as a type of hormone replacement therapy to say, all right, just take this and kind of, I'm, and I don't mean this in a derogatory way, but take this and go away. Because this is a big, complex situation that requires a lot of detail and a lot of understanding and a lot of, you know, coaching and a lot of, you know, lifestyle changes. So just take this pill and go away. That's number one. Number two is hormone replacement therapy. And I'd say right now, I think it's in a better, there's better opportunity to use it than there's ever been. But also, I think the majority of it is being used improperly. And I want to clarify what I mean by that meaning that you go in, you're taking blood work. And I love the question you just asked me at what time, because often when I see labs, one of the first questions I ask them, do you know where you were on your cycle? And they don't know, which means they didn't have that conversation with their other doctor either. And that is critical to understand under, when we look at progesterone and estrogen. When I can't tell you how many times that I've received labs and, lady, and the women will say, um, well, my doctor said, I'm absolutely, I, I don't make any progesterone, which is never true. You always produce something. And they'll say, I have absolutely no progesterone. I, therefore, I need to go on uh, hormone replacement therapy. Well, what day did you take your labs on? Uh, I don't know. So your doctor didn't know either. So you might have been low. You might have taken on, on day five of your, you know, right? right? And it's supposed to be low. So that's why it is a little bit different for men and women. And especially when it comes to this hormone game, the third part. So you get birth control, hormone replacement therapy, or unfortunately, the acceptance of just women are supposed to, they have cycles and they're supposed to have PMS and they just suffer. And I'd like to say that that's not an acceptable societal like answer, but unfortunately it is. Uh, well, you know what? You're in perimenopause is just what you got to go through or whatever, or you're, you know, you're a 28 year old woman. This is just part of it. No, it's so common. It's so common. I know. And it, and it doesn't need to be that way. And listen, I, I'm going to, no one's figured this out yet. I'm not a female, right? I don't have female hormones, right? But after a true. couple of years, yeah, true that, right? After several years and here, and, and then also I would say this, that so many years of being able to help a lot of women and being able to observe differently because, because I'm not a woman, I have no bias. And I looked at from this, from a clinical perspective of saying, okay, what do I see with frequency? I see that women, I do so much coaching when it comes to nutrition, and I see so many women that tell me right before their period, they don't have much discipline. They don't, so there's something going on there. And that was, I think everyone recognized that. They, they want their chocolate before their, and their mood changes. And then I see the most anxiety right before periods. How do I know that? Because I see, doctor, I had my period, I felt better. So these are hormonal imbalances that we can help. And they don't necessarily need medications and they don't necessarily need medications that make you go up one day and down the other day. So there's a lot more to this. And I think it starts with just observing. And this is where I'm going to encourage all women, if you're not tracking already, start tracking. I feel like the younger generation probably does a little better at tracking. Um, I could be wrong there, but I feel like a lot of them do. Or maybe it's just because there's so many different more wearables, like, for example, Aura Ring. I did not know that. So uh, I would say track, start there. Know that a day 12 through 14, roughly, you're going to ovulate. You're going to have high testosterone and all the things that come with testosterone, like libido and all that stuff. It's going to be fine, but it's also the most predictable time that you could get pregnant. So just be mindful of your actions that you take with your hormones. Uh, what days are those start? Say that again, if you will. Days 12 through 14. 12 through 14. Yes. I don't so, know if I can convey like how exciting it is to be presented with an alternative to um, this is just what it is. And you just have to like live with this for the rest of your life. It is so cool to have a fresh perspective with um, really actionable items that can have a profound effect on how we feel on a monthly basis. Yes. And embracing it too. embrace. And I think that's the other part, right? So, you know, so women, I, I'll give you some other 
things about men and women that are different. So a lot of women think it's a curse, right? But here's the deal. One out of two men are going to get cancer. And we'll talk about some strategies for that. And it's one out of three. So when men get more cancer, one of the reasons you got better hormones, your hormones are better protectors than ours. We just have high testosterone. We don't have this. We don't have the utilization of estrogen, which is protector of cancer. So like you want good, healthy. So in that first two weeks, get after it. Right. So you have to kind of like start to think through your schedules and say, all right, I'm going to give myself. I'm going to give myself a break here. I'm not going to push this week. I'm going to I'm going to say I'm going to back off my my aggressive yoga practice. I'm not going to get on the Peloton and kill it 28 days a week. That's a great example right there. There should be a time like for a lot of my people that are doing Peloton because they want to lose weight. Listen, the week before your cycle, back off. That's it. Embrace your hormones and what they're doing in those times. So embrace that. And then day one of your cycle, day two, ramp it right back up and give yourself a little bit of grace, thinking that you don't always have to be trying to get ahead of it because you're actually putting yourself behind. So for the women listening, I'm, you know, my, my, my goal is that they kind of embrace, okay, there's going to be a time for me to go. And then, you know, it's kind of a push and pull. And if you learn that your results are probably going to get much better, much easier too. So when you say part the estrogen is like a protector against cancer, is there like a magic in actually getting after it those first like day one through day 10? Like, does that strengthen your estrogen or enhance it? Yeah, so it's going to essentially, as as you get after it, you're abiding by what the body naturally wants to do. It wants you to use these hormones, but if you don't use them, you lose them. Okay, so we it's, so we we know that especially for like guys and testosterone. If one of the reasons a guy's testosterone is so low across the board is that one there's, there's less less weight training taking place. And there's more carbohydrate eating. So we're getting our energy from carbohydrates and we're not weight training. There's no simple law of supply and demand. So the same thing for the female body. And if we want to uh, really have good estrogen levels, exercise is going to be com- a, a component of that, making sure that we are burning up blood sugar level, you know, the, the excess sugar that's in our blood. So we can get into a little ketosis. So we have this law of supply and demand taking place. And you'll slowly be building up your testosterone. It just kind of peaks between days 12 and 14. And then it starts to kind of wither away as well. But don't use it. You lose it. So I know that there must be something dynamic about how many hours that we are fasting, Bart, because like fasting could literally be like 30 minutes between like when you take, I don't know, bites or something. And it could be like 18 hours like you did the very first time you tried. Is there some magic to like different time frames? There really is. And this is this is where I think the fun part of this conversation goes. So let let's 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 hunt this down just a little bit so so people can kind of target. And again, weight loss is the side effect, not the goal. Right. Because there's the goals are way better than weight loss. So let's just start with a 12 hour fast. And once you hit about 12 hours, your body is now is gonna go for the most part gonna use up the majority of sugar that is circulating in the bloodstream. So 12 hours, pretty relatively easy because sleeping counts. Once between the 12 and 14 hours, so you're 14 hours, extend that a little bit more, maybe into the 15 hour mark. Now you're getting into burning fat for fuel. So, so just hear me out. 15 hours, 16 hours fasting, you're going to be bringing your body into ketosis. That's simple. So if your goal, one of your goals is along with getting healthier to lose a little weight, that, that's a simple, that's a simple roadmap right there. That's, that's like the, that's the easy, boring stuff. The fun stuff starts right around that when we get a little bit longer. Now in that time, with, once you do get into ketosis, hearing about that 14, 15, 16 hour part, we are starting the autophagy phase, but really autophagy will kick in best. And this is when we start to kill, in, kill off some of the cells right around uh, the 17 hour mark. Can you just remind us, Bart, what ketosis is? Yeah, so ketosis is, so our bodies have basically two fuel sources and sources that, have, that we can use for energy. Sugar is one of them. And most of our foods will be converted to some, so carbohydrates, even some proteins, sugars, all of those will be converted to, well, used as sugar. And your body uses it very readily, very easily as a fuel source. So if it has to pick one, it's going to pick sugar if it's available, because it's just easier. Once you run out of sugar, there's a secondary fuel source that if you burn a fat cell, your body produces something called a ketone. So that's what we call ketosis. When your body is using these fat cells to make 
energy sources, which are ketones. So you got one of two options, but if the event that there's carbohydrates and sugar available, you will not be producing ketones. So the goal is that we, that's the fasting part. So I'm not putting anything in, so I can't convert anything to sugar. So then my body goes, oh, I still need energy. I still have to go to the grocery store today. I'm still going to go for the workout. I'm still going to bring the kids to school. So I got to go to work. You to do that, I have to burn fat for fuel. It doesn't always have to be a killer workout, it just has to be life. So you can just fast right in the room. Once we get into that 17 hour mark, that's when we're really getting to autophagy. That is where we're killing off the senescent cells. That's when your body is killing off any weak cell in the body. A weak cell is an abnormal cell. Viruses, bacteria, cancer cells are all abnormal. It pains me pains me when I have patients that are also being treated for cancer and they're in hospitals. I didn't know what they're eating pains me because I know that those, what, what they're serving in those hospitals. And I I also know that the data and the research that we have now about how to use intermittent fasting, or we'll call it fasting at that point to kill off these cells. There's so much data on it. It pains me to know that in this modern day era, that our hospitals, our professionals are feeding people sugar that are literally taking chemo. It, I, I, it, it's very difficult for me to comp- comprehend, quite frankly. All right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So let me let me move forward there. So now let's get out to 24 hours. And I tell you what, 24 hours is something I, I, I could see myself more and more leaning toward trying to convince people to do a 24 hour fast once a month. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm oh, going to 24 hours consecutively. We're yes. Saying. So if anyone wants to join me, I'll start it. I'm starting this Sunday and I'm going to go three o'clock Sunday until three o'clock Monday. And I'm planning on doing that every month. Next month. And I'll give you some details. I think that's just a good time because you don't have a lot going on in that time. So it's uh, really, we, good deal. we're going to have some questions, Bart, but go ahead. Yes. Yes. So, and then in that time, if you want to have your water, coffee, tea, fine, just, just make it happen. And, and I'll, I'll add to this. And some of them might say, well, is that really a fast? Listen, ideal world, it just be a water fast and get some electrolytes. But if starting it, you need a little bit of coffee or tea or bone broth, perfect. This is a journey. This is a relentless journey to continue to improve over time to get better and better results. So 24-hour fast, that is when we reset our microbiome. You know how important it is. Reset our microbiome? Yes. So what at that point, we basically give a big old shock to the microbiome. It means we haven't had any food in there. So that means the good bacteria are going to start to beat up the bad bacteria. The bad bacteria require you, require you, the candida, the yeast require you to keep feeding it. And if you don't feed it, they die off. Then your good bacteria takes over. So 24 hours, boom, we get a reset. Now you got to do all the good things we've talked about for the gut. It's not like a a perfect year, everything's done. But in 24 hours, you're going to have significant beneficial impact on your microbiome. Now let's bump it. Let's Yeah, right. So it's definitely a while. Now let's bump it out to 36 hours. Here's where your body will literally start to burn up. If you have fatty liver disease, it'll start to burn your visceral fat. This is only 12 more hours. So to make make it relative, if you went from Saturday night, let's let's, uh, let's see, what is that? Saturday night to Sunday night? Yeah, just to Monday morning. Saturday night to Monday morning, that's all you needed to do. And you'd be burning up what like people have fatty liver disease, which is a lot of people, kids have it nowadays. It's, It's awful. But fatty liver disease, one of the number one cause of fatty liver disease, not alcohol, it's toxins. That we're consuming toxins over and over again. But the moment we do that, and that's where you burn some of the, 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 the fat that it's very difficult to get through exercise. The, the fat that might be hung up in the extremities, like in the arms and whatnot, or in the legs or in the thighs and that kind of stuff. But we get a deeper level of fat burning when we get to 36 hours. That's not my favorite marker yet, though. The research that we have on this. Not, no. Yeah, the research that we have in this next one, I think is so profound and it's getting out to 48 hours and how it resets a dopamine system. Dopamine is something to do with happiness, right? Yeah, it's basically how you seek, how you basically seek pleasure in life. So we know that the, you know, suicide rate amongst veterans are, you know, astronomical. We see more people with depression than we've ever had. I think it's I, there's some crazy stat I saw the other day since COVID, since you know everyone went inside and you know was stressed out for a couple of years. The levels of 
um, drugs that we are dishing out to our you know fellow Americans and neighbors, whatnot, for depression is mind boggling. Um, and how could we fix that up? A 48 hour fast can reset your dopamine system, 48 hours. I mean, think about it, 365 days in a year, you got two days, just pick two days in a row. Now, like my fasting, would I say that you just go all of a sudden, you'll go all in, you're full out in depression and go 48 hour fasting? No, I would say that you'd work, you'd work way into it. You start with 12 hours, work up to 14, 16 hours. And I'll give a little map to this in just a moment. Maybe once a month, you do it 24 hours and you work your way, knowing where you're headed and getting excited about that. And I tell you what, you throw a cold plunge in there, you don't have to do it while you're fasting, but you start to do things like cold plunging and your intermittent fasting, maybe once every other month for 48 hours, the, the impact on your dopamine system, the pleasure that you have in life. And I'm gonna go farther with this. One of the reasons we have addictions, one of the reasons we have addictions to alcohol, one of the reasons we have addiction to food and sugar and carbohydrates, we need more and more and more of them is because as we fill up the receptors, say the sugar receptor or the vitamin receptors, we need more to get the same effect. The simple, the simple analogy is this, you know, people that are good drinkers, right? They can, they can plow back a bunch of drinks and it's because they've been drinking a lot for long periods of time. So it takes them more to become inebriated where someone like myself, or probably for you as well, one or two drinks, and you know I'm going to be loopy because my receptors are clean and that alcohol is getting right into my system. So at 48 hours, you are cleaning out all these dopamine receptor sites. So the dopamine can have an effect. This is, with, with, this is a drugless approach. And the research that we see right now that's coming out, the data is coming out, it's mind boggling. I can't imagine... I guess I could, but I, it, it seems only logical that the future medication is going to be fasting and good, good food and cold plunging when it comes to depression. I think of like that compared to um, what I've experienced in hospital rooms sounds not too bad. Bart. Yeah, right. Right. Because, and then the other thing is the empowerment part of that of taking those actions that you did that you made the change and that you're, you're, you have the power for the next move and the next change that you want in your life. I think all of those things are really, um, they're kind of beautiful in their process, in the process of becoming healthier and stronger. All right. So we're, we're going to go, we're going to extend one out here. All the way in front of this. So listen, the whole way along here, once you hit 17 hours, you are starting to kill your you're, you, you're in autophagy. You're in autophagy at 24 hours, 36 hours, 48 hours. And now the grand poopa, we're going to 72 hours, three days. When you get to three days, yes, your body is going to be clearing house all over the place. You're killing off all the bad cells. You're increasing autophagy, you're getting rid of all the senescent cells, and you completely reset your white blood cell. Essentially, you reset your immune system. Whitney, this is so significant, meaning that and again, the data that's coming out on the effects that we can do for resetting the hormonal system, resetting things like autoimmune conditions, because this we heal when we fast. And yes, again, I, I, I'm not encouraging anyone just to jump into 72 hours. And yeah, I guess we'll announce it for the first time this fall, we're going to do, I'll, I'm going to lead a 72 hour fast. And in to do that, I'm going to encourage, I have no way to monitor this, but I'm encourage that everyone start practicing. You get several 24-hour fasts underneath your belt and at least experience it before knocking it. And it also asks you to do this. Make it relative. So you go, wow, you start thinking 72 hours. How can I possibly do that? Well, basically do it from 6 o'clock on Friday to 6 o'clock on Monday. No big deal. So it'll be Friday, Saturday. Well, let's see. It'll be uh, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Yeah, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Um, easy breezy. Just three nights. No big deal. In the big picture. In the course of a year, do you have three nights you can give up to completely reset your immune system, to get rid of autoimmune conditions, to reset your dopamine, to literally enjoy life more? That's what, when you reset your dopamine system, that's what we're talking about. So 72 hours and you were going to reset. And if along, most likely along the way, if you're crazy enough to do 72 hours with us, you're probably already doing a lot of other good, healthy things. You probably got yourself in a cold shower or maybe even into a cold plunge, you're doing other things that are going to enhance the opportunities for you literally to be the best version of yourself, which is cool. The whole time you are kicking ass when it comes to cells, to cancer cells, to abnormal cells. You're kicking ass when it comes to viruses, bacteria, parasites. You're living that you're leaving them in such an unfriendly environment 
They don't want you. They want out. And this is the goal. And, the, and again, doesn't take much time. Doesn't uh, does it take some effort? Yeah, it probably takes a lot of effort. So I, so <laughs> that time frame right there, and that's really what I want to share with our audience tonight. There's exciting things. And that's why I said the weight loss is just part of it. But imagine for a moment that you reset your entire immune system. Do you know how many millions of people right now are still suffering from long hauler syndrome? You, you, you want the honest answer? This is what I'm talking about. You got to reset the cells. We have to go through autophagy. Anything you can do to increase and speed that process up, that's how you do it. That's how you kill off things. People have some damage from some of the things that they put into their body during that whole phase. How do you get rid of it? You increase the autophagy. Those are weaker cells. So you got to get rid of those weak cells. So hopefully this has, in, hopefully it's kind of thrilled some people about the idea of using fasting or intermittent fasting. As, as kind of an exciting tool to become the best version of themselves. And hopefully I, I made it as clear as can be, or at least more clear. I have to tell you, Bart, this action really sounds like a relentless kind of thing. It is, it is. And I don't want, I think about all the time, all right, 72 hours, which 72 hours? This, this Sunday, I'm going to go for my 24 hours, right? And I think about what do I normally do on Sunday? Here's the, going to be the biggest challenge for every one of us, I believe. We seek so much pleasure with food. And I could just put a period right there. And that is the challenge. We seek so much pleasure with food with then, and it has power over us. The only way we get that power back is we choose that we don't need it at times. And we can do without and we can live our lives. So if we can get to that spot and food can be super, super addictive, especially these processed foods right now. Um, my wife was just posting something on Instagram about like Chick-fil-A having like 40 or 50 different ingredients in them and how addictive they are. And because they're geniuses that are making these foods, they're geniuses that are these, when I say genius, they are scientists literally trying to produce formulas that make it super addictive. So you want to eat their food more than the other guy's food. So for us to get back to God's garden the best that we can and get back to flex and a little discipline. But I also think as much as they're addictive, I think feeling good is addictive. I've, I've mentioned it here before. I really feel as though I'm in the best place. You know, and listen, I know I'm a study of one, right? So, but I, I, I'll, I'll say this from experience. At 53, I feel better now. I feel like my brain's working better now in my life than it ever, ever has. And granted, I'm doing more than I ever, ever have. And I think that right there once you kind of turn that corner a little bit, I don't know that it's ever been easy. I think it's the concept is simple. Move right, eat right, think right. You do those things consistently and you continue to find yourself in positions to win. And this is an important part, the people around you. So listen, <laughs> don't, get, don't get done listening to this podcast and tell your spouse, hey, we're gonna do a 72 hour fast. That's probably not a winnable situation, right? So Put yourself in an environment with the people, the tribe, the people that have the same type of thoughts and actions that support the ones that you do. And when you do that, that and I think that's a big reason why this is easiest now for me now. I could say it's easier now because those are the people I surround myself with. And I'll encourage everyone out there that keep finding your tribe. Keep hunkering down. And if you're listening to a podcast like this, you've kind of found part of your tribe, right? So you're listening, you're fulfilling your brain and putting things into your, to your consciousness that are supporting ideas and values that you have. And then go out and seek those people. If you're thinking that alcohol isn't great for you, probably don't show up as at many bars, right? And if you know exercise is really good for you, make you know get to the gym, that kind of stuff. So, um, and again, hopefully for the, the women that are listening tonight, that- the takeaway is this, that if you recognize how your body works and recognize it works different than a guy's and you should not compare your results or try to compete with your husband or your spouse or your best friend, because our fasting is much different for both of us. And yet give yourself some grace. And I've just given you permission, you know, a week before your cycle, back it off, tone it down a little bit. Don't push as hard. Embrace the essence of being a woman, that you have these influctuations of hormones and they do change. And the more you embrace that, I think it's going to be a lot easier for you. So with all of this awesome information in mind, Bart, for all of our listeners tonight, what is one step mm. that they can take towards becoming superhuman? Well, I think I just mentioned them all. Um, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll leave it. So as we all know that the world is changing rapidly. It always has, but the world is changing rapidly. So the world is becoming different. So we need to be different as well. 
So we have more chemicals this year than we did last year. We have more stressors. We have more, you know, this 5G. It's going to be 6G. It's going to be 20G, whatever. And all of these things do matter. The human body is complex. So have a game plan that does a little bit of everything. So be more relentless and do more things. And that would be my message. Beautiful, Bart. Thank you guys so much for joining us tonight on the Health Made Simple show. Thank you, everyone, for being here once again. Keep doing your thing. Keep sharing it out. Keep spreading the love. If you are watching this on Spotify or YouTube and you can leave us a review, awesome. Five star would be awesome. Keep doing your thing. And of course, if you think this applies to someone, share it out. That's how we grow our podcast is from people like you sharing it out with your friends and family. So and then, of course, you're going to continue to take deliberate action for your mind, your body, your overall wellness. Y'all be awesome. <laughs>